This video is to support a course that I'm teaching in introductory proof writing. And we're looking at equivalence relations in the previous video, this video, and the next video. So I want to recall that an equivalence relation is a relation on a set A. And by a relation, I just mean a subset of A cross A that satisfies three properties. The first one is reflexivity. That is that all values X in A are related to themselves. The next is symmetry. So if X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. And finally, we have transitivity. So if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z. So we want to think about the notion of equivalence relation as some sort of abstraction of the notion of equality, maybe an, ab an abstraction that allows things to be related that aren't necessarily equal. Next, I want to recall what an equivalence class is. So the equivalence class of an element X in A, so we generally denote it by this bracket X, and that's going to be the set of all Y in A that are related to X. And I want to point out here that this X is sometimes called an equivalence class representative. So that's important to take note of. Okay, so we're going to start off with a fairly general theorem, and that says if R is an equivalence relation on A, so A can be any set, R is any equivalence relation, then the equivalence class of X equals the equivalence class of Y, if and only if X is related to Y. Okay, so this is a biconditional statement, which means there are two things to prove. We need to prove the forward direction, in other words, start off by assuming that the equivalence classes are equal and show that this means that these two elements are related and then also prove the reverse direction. Okay, so let's do this forward direction first. So we'll start off by supposing that the equivalence class of X is equal to the equivalence class of Y. But if these two equivalence classes are equal, then it's very easy to find an element that's in both of them since they're the same. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's take an element Z that's in the equivalence class of X, and it's obviously in the equivalence class of Y given that Y is the same thing as the equivalence class of X. Okay, but now notice that that implies that X is related to Z and Y is related to Z. X is related to Z is just because Z is in the equivalence class of X. Y is related to Z, to Z is because Z is in the equivalence class of Y. Okay, but next up we can take this Y is related to Z and use symmetry to change this to Z is related to Y. So here we're doing a lot of details, maybe some that wouldn't be super necessary, but I just want to make sure that we dot all our I's and cross all our T's here. But now we can apply transitivity to these two orange underlined statements to say that X is related to Y. And that's how we'll finish this off. So X is related to Y, but that's exactly where we wanted to end up at the end of this first direction. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and do the reverse direction. We just got done showing one direction of this proof. Now we're going to show the reverse direction. So we want to start off by supposing that this is true. So let's do that. So we're going to suppose that X is related to Y. And let's go ahead and just point out that what we want to end up with, so we want to show that the equivalence class of X is equal to the equivalence class of Y. So in fact, that means we're trying to show that two sets are equal. But our best way to show that two sets are equal is by double inclusion. That is, we'll show that the equivalence class of X is a subset of the equivalence class of Y and vice versa. So let's set that up. So I'll say the first thing that we'll prove is that the equivalence class of X is a subset of the equivalence class of Y. And we'll do that using our standard method for showing uh, that one set is a subset of the other. So let's suppose that Z is in the equivalence class of X, but by the definition of the equivalence class, that means that X is related to Z. But then by transitivity, we see that Y is related to Z. 
maybe using symmetry in there as needed. So look, we've got X is related to Y. That's what we started off with. X is related to Z. That's because Z is in that equivalence class. Putting those two together gets Y is related to Z. But now Y being related to Z is equivalent to saying that Z is in the equivalence class of Y. But let's see what we did. We took an arbitrary element from the equivalence class of X and we showed that it was in the equivalence class of Y. But that means that we have finished this goal of showing the equivalence class of X is a subset of the equivalence class of Y. Okay, so let's maybe do the containment in the other direction. In other words, we wanna show the equivalence class of Y is a subset of the equivalence class of X. This is gonna be essentially the same as what we did up here, just because there's like some nice symmetry built into this whole setup. Okay, so let's suppose that maybe we'll use a different letter here. We'll call it W is in the equivalence class of Y, but that tells us that Y is related to W. Okay, but then if Y is related to W and X is related to Y, then we know that X is also related to W, again, by using transitivity and symmetry. But then if X is related to W, that tells us that W is in the equivalence class of X, but that tells us in the end that the equivalence class of Y is a subset of the equivalence class of X. But finally, putting these two subset conditions together tells us that the equivalence class of X is equal to the equivalence class of Y, which is what we wanted to show in this reverse direction. Okay, let's get rid of this and we'll look at the notion of a partition of a set. Next up, we wanna look at the notion of a partition of a set, which as we'll see later is in some ways equivalent to the notion of an equivalence relation. Okay, so a partition of a set A is a collection of disjoint, non-empty subsets of A whose union is all of A. So in other words, the par partition itself, which sometimes we'll use this kind of script P to be, is a subset of the power set of A. But it can't be all of the power set of A because the power set of A contains an empty set that's not allowed and the power set of A definitely contains overlapping sets, which is also not allowed. Okay, let's look at some examples. So my first example is just even integers and odd integers. So look, I've got a set containing the set of all even integers and the set of all odd integers. So if I take the union of even and odd numbers, I get all integers. But then a number is either even or odd. It can't be both. So there's no overlap in these sets. So in other words, what we have here is a partition of the integers z. Now look at this. This is going to be a partition of the real numbers. So notice it's made up of a bunch of half open intervals. So we've got the interval from negative one to zero, including the left-hand endpoint, negative one, the interval zero to one, the interval zero to two, so on and so forth in both directions. So here we could maybe write this partition as an indexed set of subsets like this. So we'll say P in this case will be all of the sets N comma N plus one, where N ranges over all integers. Notice that these are definitely non-overlapping because I've got an endpoint on the left-hand side but not on the right-hand side. And then these also union to get all of the real numbers and we can write that down like this. Notice the real numbers is the union over all n and z of n comma n plus one where I've given that half openness to it. Now next up I wanna do a little bit more of an abstract example. So let's say we've got this arbitrary four element set, A, B, C, D, and let's just write down some partitions. Remember by a partition, I just mean a set of disjoint non-empty subsets. So we've got a bunch of choices here. I will not write them all down. So here's one example of a partition. So I'll call this one P1. So let's say A and B are in the same portion of the partition. 
and C and D are also in the same portion of the partition. Now let's look at another one, maybe we'll call this one P2. And here we'll say that A, B, and C are in one portion of the partition, but D is by itself. Let's maybe write one more down, maybe P3, and that would be A, B, C, D are all in the same part of the partition. So here we haven't really done anything. Whereas in these two cases, we have cut the set up into more manageable pieces. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and we're gonna prove a result that links partitions with equivalence relations. We're gonna finish this video by proving a pretty classic result. And that says if we've got an equivalence relation on a set A, we'll call that equivalence relation R, then the set of equivalence classes under this equivalence relation R forms a partition of A. So here I'm linking the idea an equivalence relation and a partition. Okay, so let's maybe set this collection of subsets of A, which will become our partition, equal to a script P, like the notation we were using before. So I'm gonna set P equal to the set of all equivalence classes of elements as we run through all guys that are inside of A. So I can write it like that. So there are three things that we need to check. So we need to check that all of these sets are non-empty, they are disjoint, and their union is all of A. So let's maybe show that they're all non-empty first. So I'll write that here. So this is actually not so hard to do because we can notice that for all X in A, X is in its own equivalence class. Well, X is related to itself, so we know X is in its own equivalence class. But the fact that every equivalence class has at least itself as an element tells us that this equivalence class cannot be the empty set. Okay, great, so we're good to go on that. So next we'll show that their union is all of A. So I'm doing it in a slightly different order than I have written down here in the definition, but that's okay. This is maybe a more natural order to do the proof. So let's write this down into more of like a set equation that we can prove using our proofs of sets method. So what we really want to show here is A is equal to the union over all of X in A of the equivalence class of X. So that would do this exactly. Okay, so let's start off by supposing that we have an element from A, I'll call it Y just because we used X as our indexing thing right here. But by this thing that we noticed up here, we see that Y is in its own equivalence class. But this is the union of all of the equivalence classes. So that means that this Y, which is in its own equivalence class, is also inside of the union of all of its equivalence classes. Given that this value of Y here is one of these that is part of our union. But let's see what we've got. We have Y started in A and it ended in this union, but that tells us that A is a subset of this union. And now how would we do the reverse containment? Well, there's actually not a ton to do here. We can just say that the union over all X in A of the equivalence class of X is a subset of A by definition. Great. And how is that by definition? Well, look how we defined the equivalence class of X. It's only made up of elements from A in the first place. So there's nothing to do in that direction, which means we have ended up showing that A is the union of all of these equivalence classes. Okay, so all that's left to prove is that they are disjoint. In other words, equivalence classes either overlap totally or they overlap none at all. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. So let's go ahead and suppose that X and Y are in A, and let's point out that what we want to show is that the equivalence class of X equals the equivalence class of Y, or the equivalence class of X intersected with the equivalence class of Y equals the empty set. So that's equivalent to this disjointness. 
Okay, so let's see how we could do this maybe. Well, we can break this into two cases. So the first case is that x is related to y. But notice, if x is related to y, then by the theorem that we started this video off with, we know that the equivalence class of x is equal to the equivalence class of y. But that's one of the things that we could have ended up with that was good. So now let's look at our second case. So let's look at case two, which is x is not related to y. There's actually not enough room to finish this case on the board, so we'll get rid of this and we'll finish it off on a clean board. Now we're ready to finish this off. All that's left to show is that distinct equivalence classes are disjoint. We just finished showing that if x was related to y, then the equivalence class of x was equal to the equivalence class of y. That was based on a theorem we did previously in the video. That was our first case. Our next case is what if x is not related to y? So what we want to end up with here is that the equivalence class of x intersected with the equivalence class of y is the empty set. So like I just said, that's what we want to show in this case, and that'll finish this whole argument off. So how can we do that? Well, what we'll do is suppose that we have an element in this intersection and show that that leads to a contradiction. So let's write that out. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that Z is in the equivalence class of X intersected with the equivalence class of Y. But by the definition of intersection, that means that Z is in the equivalence class of X and Z is in the equivalence class of Y. But by the definition of equivalence classes, that means that Z is related to X and Z is related to Y. But now if Z is related to X and Z is related to Y, then by properties of, of equivalence relations, that tells us that X is related to Y. But notice that contradicts our original assumption that X was not related to Y. So what caused the whole problem here? Well, when we supposed that the intersection of these two equivalence classes was not disjoint, that was the problem. Now, before we stop, I wanna point out that there is somewhat of a converse of this theorem that says if you have a partition, then you can construct an equivalence class. But I'm not gonna do a proof of that because if you're in the course that I'm teaching, um, that'll be one of your homework problems. And so that's a good place to stop.